together in a few moments. You know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, how great this new church is because it's all on one level, and so you don't have to climb any stairs. Everybody's excited about that. Nobody thinks about me. I had to climb two stairs to get up here <laughs> this morning. Bunch of selfish people, I tell you what. Psalm 127 <laughs> uh, is, uh, is what we'll look at. Uh, we're talking about uh, the subject of who builds the house, who builds the house. Uh, Wow, we're here. Isn't that nuts? <laughs> Man, I tell you what, uh, we, uh, you, you know that uh, we've been, most of you anyway, that we're, we're in a series uh, called Authentic uh, from 1 John, and we've been just uh, talking about uh, one line at a time there through 1 John as, as God's Word instructs us to to teach, and, and so um, as we've uh, worked through this authentic series, we knew that we had to deviate from that this weekend and, and talk more about what it is that um, God has been doing uh, in getting us into this facility. And uh, I tell you, um, it, it was not hard to figure out what text to preach from. That was not difficult at all. Uh, I'll tell you more about that at the end of the message, but uh, you know, Psalm 127 says what? Unless the Lord builds the house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Those who build it labor in vain. David uh, wrote that psalm, King David wrote that psalm, and he wrote it for his son Solomon. Uh, David's concern for his son Solomon was that uh, David had been a man who had made a lot of mistakes in his life. Um, I've heard it said before that we talk about how great David is, but most of us, if we met him, probably wouldn't like him very much. He was a man who made those kind of mistakes, um, the kind of mistakes that cause some people to, to really have trouble with another person. And uh, rightly so, maybe, in some cases. His sins were, were great. Uh, murder was involved. Adultery was involved. There were things in his life that were um, difficult to overlook. But then the Bible goes on to say this about David, that he was a man after God's own heart. And you say, go figure, how do you do that? How do you commit those kind of sins and still be a man after God's own heart? And I don't know about you, but for me, that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, anybody have a past? I have a past. Sometimes I have a present that's not so, <laughs> not so great. Uh, so I'm thankful for God's word and the integrity of God's word, the veracity of God's word, where we look at the text and we see people who aren't anywhere close to perfect. David had all of these sins, and then the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. He kept coming back to God. He finally then had a life that was stable in God. The sin was not so... Um, grievous any longer. It was the kind of sin that we can deal with that doesn't destroy others. Amen? That's what David wanted for his son was that kind of life. And so this is, verse 1 really represents that kind of prayer for his son, doesn't it? Unless the Lord builds the house, son, those who build it labor in vain. And he's suggesting to Solomon, his son, your house needs to be built this way, your family needs to be built this way, your career needs to be built this way. And then remember, too, that Solomon is the one who built the temple. And so your church needs to be built this way. Unless the Lord builds the house... Those who build it labor in vain. That little verse uh, is, is, is short and sweet, but it's comprised of four key components. 
As you look at that verse, you'll notice that there is, we'll notice in a moment, we'll dig this out, but there is a paradox immediately that we'll look at. There is a main point, there is a purpose, and then there is the people that we need to contend with, and we need to look at those four things to understand the verse. The first thing that we really need to grab hold of as we try to understand this verse is the paradox. Um, Paradox is a word that you don't hear very often. Paradox means a statement that seems to be absurd or contradictory, but in fact is true. Look at the verse again, and let me show you the paradox. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Who's building the house? (laughs) Is it God or is it people? Right? There's a paradox there, isn't there? Um, But here's what I want you to understand about that. Where some people would find contradiction in Scripture, there is no such thing. The fact is that every major doctrine in the Bible contains that kind of paradox. The kind of paradox that says, okay, we have to live in this. And if we're going to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to do it, but we have to do it with him. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Uh, I think the, the greatest verse to speak to this directly is, is uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says this, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Watch this now. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now the fact is that none of us can actually earn our salvation. So clearly God's word is not speaking that we can somehow, as Pastor Ryan said, uh, become righteous on our own. That's not possible. But according to Romans chapter 3 and verse 22, we have a righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. And that comes to all who believe. That is life-changing, savingly believe in the sacrifice of Christ. Then he imputes his righteousness to us. And so we have this God-given gift of righteousness put on us through Jesus Christ. Now after that happens, this is the way we live right here. Work out your own salvation. How many of you know that when you come to belief in Jesus Christ, you're not finished? Anybody with me? Uh, you know, it's, it, that's like mixing up the cake batter and just leaving it on the counter, right? It's not done. And, and we're not done. And until you're, you're dead, you're not done. <laughs> and so uh, there, God is still working. And what am I doing while God is working? I'm working out my salvation. I'm, I'm figuring out with God how that works in my life and in every part of my life, how true salvation through Jesus Christ works. I'm figuring that out with him. But the neat thing is this, I'm not gutting it out The Bible says his commands are not burdensome. So that second verse, verse 13, says what? God has changed my uh, capacities. He's changed my desires so that when I was saved, if I'm saved, I have different desires. I want different things. My pursuit is what? God. Anybody home? My pursuit is God. He actually does that. That's a real thing that God does. And so from then on, my desire is to do what? Work out my salvation. And I do that with what? Fear and trembling. So there's paradoxes all over God's word, but they're right and they're true. And so is this one at Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build labor in vain. So you can work your tail off, and it could be for nothing because... It didn't start in the right place and didn't continue in the right place. Is anybody home? It's from that paradox that we get the point of the psalm too. That first section of the psalm gives us the point of the whole thing, which is, unless the Lord. Here's the point, unless the Lord. How many of you know... (laughs) How many of you understand at this point that you've tried lots of things and you recognize that, look, unless the Lord, 
it's not going to work. It's not going to, there's not going to be any lasting value in it. Um, in fact, whatever my efforts are, I'm going to crash again eventually because my power, my strength doesn't do anything. Unless the Lord. Again, the golden cord throughout Scripture speaks to this. Jesus saying at John chapter 15, the exact same thing, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. Right there, what's that saying? Life works. He, do, he accomplishes something. Right? He accomplishes something. For apart from me, you can do what? Come on now, apart from me, you can do what? That's quite a claim. I'm getting to be an old man, and you know what? I find that to be more and more true every year of my life. Uh, there was a time where I would fight that like a stupid kid. Oh, sure. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I accomplished a lot. You know what? There is nothing in my life Listen, please, I beg of you, look at me. There's nothing in my life that has any lasting value that was done apart from Jesus Christ. Nothing. I can't think of one thing. So unless you work and he works in you, it's for no good. Nothing happens. It's going to come to nothing. So what about the purpose of the psalm? What about the purpose of Psalm 127? What's the purpose of it? Well, it, it's, it's all about building. Unless the Lord builds the house, it's all about building something, isn't it? It's about building a life. It's about building a church. It's about building a family. It's about how we build. That's what it's about. Whatever it is that you're thinking you're going to do with your life, it's about how you do that. That's what it's about. It's all about life and business and career and family. And, and it applies so much to our church today. I, I like what Jeremiah says about this. Jeremiah 22 says, woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness. That word righteous means right with God. Say that with me. Right with God. The fact of the matter is, this is a black and white issue. You're either right with God or you're not. There's no gray area in there. And so, woe to him who builds anything in a manner and a life and a way that is not right with God. Woe to him. You know what that means when somebody does, does the woe thing? I'm not talking about at the end of a ride on a horse. Come on, that was funny. It wasn't practiced, but it was funny. Anyway, um, so... Uh, what, what does woe mean? It means you're, you're going to be sorry. And, and it's not like God is threatening you. It, it's, it's like God is loving you, right? He's saying, you know what? Here's your opportunity to build right. Here it is. Because you're going to be sorry if you don't. It's going to come to nothing again. Unless you work and he works in you, building will come to nothing. And then there's the people in the psalm. The people. Here's what he says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it. Those who build it. First thing that I would call your attention to is, isn't this cool? We get second line. God gets first, right? I mean, even the psalm is constructed the way it ought to be. Unless God builds, what you build is nothing. However, 
We are called to build, aren't we? We're called to do something. Isn't that true? Those who build. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you, uh, and I will not do justice to how much work was put into this building. Man, uh, when we looked at it, uh, those of you who have been to the old church, you understand what I'm saying. When we looked at it, we thought, this place is great because it looks so much better than what we had, right? <laughs> it was so far beyond where we were that it was fantastic, but then we got here and it was like, man, there's a lot to do. There are people who took vacation time to put this place together. There are, there are people who sacrificed so much to do this. And, and people who are still sacrificing to do this. But here's the issue. You can't miss it, can you? Unless the Lord builds it, those who labor, labor in vain. That word vain is a Hebrew word pronounced shab. It means failing to have the intended or desired result. The idea is this, that people build and they really think they're doing something. And then it turns out to be to not have the desired result. Do you know why we generally build? Uh, how many of you know that we, um, we're always building something? Isn't that right? We're always building something. It's, you know, we're little miniature creators. <laughs> and we're always making or building something. I'm trying to build my life. I'm trying to build a relationship. I'm trying to build a career. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, uh, somebody's sewing. Somebody's making something in the garage. Every, we're always building. And, and the desire for most of us is to accomplish something, to feel accomplished, to feel like we did something. But at the end, that could be a very vain pursuit. Unless we work and God works in us, whatever it is could be a vain pursuit. So here's what I want to do in our last few minutes together. Are you ready? Let me just show you three things that I think God, God's word clearly says that would help us to be certain that would ensure that we are not laboring in vain. Whatever we do, whatever we do, we need to have some insurance that we're not laboring in vain. The first thing is this, the foundation must be Jesus. If you want to ensure that you are not laboring in vain, the foundation must be Jesus. Jesus. Everything starts with a foundation. You're, you are beginning with something in mind, some motivation, some reason for building. Now, if you work and he works in you, that reason, that foundation must be Jesus. Jesus. So take your Bibles, if you would, please turn over to 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, and uh, we'll look here at verses nine through eleven.
This is all about ensuring that your labor is not in vain. We are God's fellow workers, he says here at verse 9. So pastors and so on are God's fellow workers, but notice, you are God's field, God's what? Building. Who is? You are God's building. You are God's building. Those who are believers in Jesus Christ are God's building. He's talking about building people. That's what God is talking about. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, Paul says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Now watch this. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Watch this. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. So again, let me call attention to the fact that when God is talking about building something, pay attention to this, pay close attention to this. You might want to build something, you might want to put something out there, you might want to grow something, you might want to make something, a marriage, a project, whatever uh, it is, but the fact of the matter is that God says that there is a foundation that has already been laid. Listen, here's what God has done. God has made a way for you to be right with him, and that way is through Jesus Christ. Christ. God sent one person, his son, to be crucified on the cross to pay for your sin that you might be right with him. And so he says, I've laid a foundation that you cannot, you, you, you cannot build on anything else. There's no way anything else is going to work because I, God, have already laid the foundation and this is the one that you must build upon. There's no other way. There's no other way. And look at this, I want you to understand something. It, it, it begins with you. you. We have this tendency to think I've got to get something done. I've got to go take care of this. I've got to build this. I've got to make this. God says that starts with you. There's no point in trying to build anything at all unless God is building you. That's where it starts. What's God doing in your life? It begins with Jesus, that's the foundation, and then God wants to build you from there. Whatever you build will be nonsense. It, it's not going to work apart from Christ. That's the foundation. I think about the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Great story. A bunch of people got together and they said, we're gonna build a tower to heaven, that's how we're gonna get to God. So they built this tower, and, and by the way, the, the subtitle there that they get together when they're talking, they say, let us build and make a name for ourselves. We're going to be famous. We're going to build this thing. We're going to be something, and I think a lot of times our motivation in making something is all about that. We're going to build something, and it's going to be about us. The foundation needs to be in Christ. That tower was confounded the workers were confounded so they couldn't even communicate together the foundation must be in Christ on Christ the second thing that I would say is this in order that our labor is not in vain God must establish the foundation God must establish the foundation here's what I mean by this you might think that's redundant because I just said Look, it has to be a foundation in Christ. But, but here's the deal. How many of you, when I say something about, th this is sheer honesty that I'm asking for right now. How many of you, when I say the foundation needs to be on Christ, say something like this in your mind? I've tried that. I know, no hands. Fact is, there are some of you who are suffering through some terrible things in your life and you believe that you have put your foundation on Christ. You, you, have, you, you believe that your foundation has been on Christ, but here's the problem. Here's the problem. God did not establish that foundation. You did. We'd love to be God, wouldn't we? I'm going to tell God that he's going to save me. 
that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell God that he's going to save me. Unless God establishes that foundation in Christ, it's not established. It's not. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I would love for you to see to, I would love for you to see your foundation in Christ established by God today. So we want to be sure we're talking about the right thing here. Matthew chapter 16 and we'll look at verses 15 through 18. 15 through 18. So Jesus is in an intense conversation with his disciples right here. And ultimately what his conversation is about is determining who's saved and who's not among them. Who's right with God and who's not among the disciples. And so uh, Matthew chapter 16 beginning at verse 15 he says this to sort it all out. He said to them, uh, but who do you say that I am? So Jesus saying to his disciples, who do you say that I am? What's your answer to that? Put yourself in that place. Who do you say that Jesus is? Now, Simon Peter answered in verse 16, um, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the, the one who's been promised to come and save us from our sins. You are the Son of the living God. Verse 17, watch this now. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh, watch now, very closely, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a model of saving faith right there. Belief that saves. Belief that creates a foundation. It it comes, watch that now, right there. It comes not from flesh and blood because flesh and blood cannot save. Is anybody with me? How many of you are made of flesh and blood? You cannot save yourself. You cannot even decide to be saved. God is not a genie that will be put in a box. It, it must be a God-given revelation that Jesus is the Son of God who came to pay for your sins. It must be a God-given revelation of that. Somehow God does something where he wakes me up, opens my heart, causes me to have saving belief in Jesus. It's, it's not me doing that. Now, the truth is this. When God... Uh, when the plan, when, when the word of God is presented, how many of you understand it's going to be a flesh and blood presenter? Right? But intellectually understanding the message will not save you. God must take his word, watch this close, God must take his word and then by the work of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, supernaturally implant his word in you thereby causing saving belief. So it produces repentance, that is turning from your sin. This is what it causes when God does this. It causes repentance, turning from your sin, and turning to the cross of Christ for salvation. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says you must be born again. You must be born again. He said, that which is born of flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of heaven. So, you, unless, he says, there's that word again, unless you're born again, John chapter 3, you don't see the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, God birthing you from flesh life into a new life in Christ, unless God does that. So you might say, well, what's my part in that? 
What do I do? And the Bible says repent and believe. So what do you do? I would be crying out to God and saying, God, save me. I don't think, the truth of the matter is, I, I need to not be um, deceived any longer. I need to cry out to God and say, God, save me. Do this. What what only you can do. I believe, God, I believe that only you can do this, that I can't cause this to happen. So I'm begging you, God, like a beggar before the throne, save me, help me. I'm a sinner, I'm messed up. Do what only you can do, God. God must establish the foundation. Last thing. From there, from that point of God establishing the foundation, the building material then must be the word of God. Where do I go from here? Let's say that God does save me today. Where do I go? I go to the word of God and all of that building, anything that, I, that, that, that God puts on my heart to build from then on, then on. I, I want a marriage, I want family, I want a career, I want anything that God puts on my heart, from there I build with the word of God. How do I do it? What, what's the way I do it? What, how do I function in this new salvation by the word of God? What does it say about what I'm doing? Luke chapter 6. Turn over to Luke chapter 6, please. Luke chapter 6. We need to learn to use the Word of God for all building material. Everything we build, we need to learn to use the Word of God for it. Just like we would learn anything else, we learn the Word of God. Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 47. Here's what Jesus says. Listen very carefully. Somebody say, I'll listen. Everyone who comes to me, Jesus says, and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose... The stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them, does not do my word, is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. <laughs> and when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. What was the foundation? Jesus Christ was the foundation. Remember? Somebody say, I remember. Jesus Christ was the foundation. The person who thinks, believes they have that foundation and then does not build on the word of God is a person who never had that foundation. So we start on that foundation, Jesus says, and then from there we build with his word. We have a hunger for it. We have a desire for it because he wills and works in us to do that, to give that to us. Amen? Amen. And what happens? The house stands. What I build stands because it was built on that foundation and built with the Word of God, doing the Word of God. So look, we and what we build will either stand the test of time or it will not. It will stand or fall. So what do we have? We have a foundation in Jesus. We have a foundation that must be established by God the Father himself. And we have that foundation and then the construction of whatever is built afterward on the word of God. Amen? So, look at this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor labor in vain. Those who build it labor in vain. The results? This is the last piece you need to understand. If it is built, if it is built by you with God, the result will be this. 
God will receive the glory. God will be glorified by it. Somebody say, I hear you. God will be glorified by it. That's the final piece. When I look at whatever it is that I build, does God receive glory from that or do I? Does God receive glory or do I? You know, I was looking at uh, some old North Park news newsletter archives uh, trying to figure out when we first started talking about building this building, um, getting into a new church. By the way, we've, we've been all over the map with that. We, we originally, I think, were talking maybe about building out there by the old building and we were going to knock that down and that was going to be a parking lot. And, and then we changed our mind and we, we looked at some property downtown. We looked at other properties all over the place and nothing was working. But I look back at our newsletter archives and it was November 2008 when I wrote the first article in our newsletter about buying some property or building something. So that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago. And I'm pretty sure I probably talked about it some before that. The point is this. If the Lord is going to build the house, we're going to have to wait on him. We're going to have to wait on him. When your foundation is in Jesus Christ, one of the things that you get used to doing is this, waiting on God. Instead of, look, instead of running ahead and trying to figure out how to get something done, what am I doing? I'm following God through it. What do you want to do, God? When do you want to do it, God? How do you want to do it, God? I'm slowing down. I'm doing it the way God wants me to do it. Then I can be sure. The Lord builds the house. The Lord builds the house. That way we don't run ahead, we don't lag behind. We follow God through it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, I thank you, Lord, for, uh, for a great celebration of what you have accomplished here. Um, Father, I, I thank you, Lord, that the foundation for this church is in Jesus Christ. It's in, it's in salvation through Christ, and it's in a, a salvation that is established by you, God, and, and not some, you know, put your hand up or, or, or walk down the aisle kind of thing. It's a, it's a, it's a God-given foundation through the Word of God. And Father, we thank you that we are building on the word and not something else, not man's ideas, but the word of God. So that, Father, we can be certain that we do not labor in vain. Now, Lord, we would pray. Um, we would ask you right now, Father, for salvation for those who do not know you those who honestly, right now, where they sit, um, really just, as I was preaching, perhaps didn't even have a capacity for what it was that I was saying because the Word of God has no place in your heart. God, please grab hold and establish a faith in them. Right now, perhaps you are crying out and saying, God, save me. But remember, Jesus' message was repent and believe. So turn from sin. Do a 180. Turn from your sin. Saying, God, I don't want it anymore. Not just the big ones that control me, but anything, God, that separates me from you. Anything that your word says I need to be rid of. God, please, I want to be done with it. And then I turn and I look to the cross of Jesus Christ, the only place where God's hatred of sin and his love for believers comes together.
the only place. No other place has God arranged for that intersection of those two things to happen. So we look on the cross and we beg God to save us. God, we see that that's where salvation happens. So please, God, put saving faith in hearts. Save as only you can, Father. And Lord God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We love you. We celebrate you. We thank you. And all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.